Johannes Kepler was the last uh, great astronomer before the invention of the telescopes. And uh, so he lived around 1590s, six, early 1600s. Uh, back in the days when astronomy was just looking at the sky with your eyes. And um, of course astronomers and scientists were always trying to figure out what's going on up there. There were five, five stars up there that kept moving in uh, relation to everything else. All the other stars just kind of rotated in mass every year. These stars would rotate so those constellations would always show up. But there are those five stars up there, they're not really stars, we can call them planets, that you can see that kept moving around <laughs> relative to all the other stars. So they were eventually called planets, and the ones you can see with the eye, of course, are Mercury, um, Venus, and uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. You can, if you have great eyes, you can see Uranus, Uranus if you know where to look, um, but you really have to know what you're doing and where to look. Uh, Uranus was discovered in 1784 by telescopes, and then of course there's other planets, Neptune, and I'm still a big fan of calling Pluto a planet. So, all right. So anyway, um, yeah, the stars are interesting. What's different about these planets? What what makes them different, and and how do they move? And so Kepler looked at uh, data for for decades, about 20 or 30 years. He poured over. You know, recorded data about where the planets were. Like on such and such a night, uh, here was Saturn at this time, and here was uh, Jupiter at this time. And uh, he collected all that information. Probably took a lot of uh, observations himself. And he fiddled with the math for a long time, and finally came up with what we call the Kepler's laws, the three laws of planetary motion. And uh, he came up with this, and within about 70 years, uh, Sir Isaac Newton came up with calculus and physics, Newtonian physics, and he was able to prove Kepler's laws. I don't know if Newton proved Kepler's laws, but someone did uh, once we had calculus. All right, so what are they? The first Kepler's law is that, um, and I'm going to draw an ellipse, because mostly these concern ellipses, but we can tie it to uh, hyperbolas as well. So here's my ellipse, and the sun Kepler's first law says that the, the sun is positioned at the foci of an ellipse and the planets orbit the sun in an ellipse. Alright, so planets travel around the, the sun in an ellipse where the sun is out of foci. That, wow, where did that come from? Okay, very neat observation. So uh, all, all, orbits, uh, all orbits are Elliptical. You could theoretically have a circular orbit. A circle is just like an ellipse with the eccentricity equal to zero. But uh, anyway, that's how things orbit. So um, along there, that's Kepler's first law. The second law of planetary motion is that the the square of the time required for one orbit is proportional to the cube of the average distance from the sun. Wow. Okay, this is actually the easiest one for me to prove using calculus and physics. This almost comes as, is almost too easy to prove. Um, but um, what it does is that, okay, our orbit is one year, and we know what our average distance to the Sun is. So if we observe, for example, uh, Jupiter, I don't recall how long it takes Jupiter, eight or, eight or 11 years maybe, I don't know. Whatever it is, however long it takes Jupiter to orbit the Sun, if you square that, that's proportional to the cube of the average distance. So you can plug Earth's numbers and Jupiter's numbers into here, and you can calculate the, uh, the distance that Jupiter is from the Sun, and, and therefore you could work out the, uh, the, the distance from Earth to Jupiter. Of course, it varies depending on the, where you are in the orbit, but you could work that out, the, the distance that Jupiter is from the Sun. Uh, pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Now the third law of uh, planetary motion, Kepler's laws, is uh, kind, of, kind of funny. Alright, so the amount of time, if, if you have a fixed amount of time, we'll call it T, maybe T is a week. Alright, so the area swept out in an amount of time is equal no matter where you are in the orbit. So here we go. So, for example, if I'm over here, 
they're orbiting, when you're close to the sun, you orbit faster. It sweeps out this area. Back here, you're farther away. In the same amount of time, this area would be equal. These two areas would be equal. And uh, that's Kepler's third law. That's, that's a pretty amazing. And I look at that thinking, ah, that's some calculus. Okay, we could prove that with some calculus. But uh, kind, of, kind of amazing here, Kepler's laws. All right, so um, let's have a little bit of fun with this. If um, comets um, vary greatly, there's uh, Inkey's, Inkey's, E-N-C-K-E, Inkey's Comet is the, uh, uh, goes around the sun every uh, about three and a half years, so it's the closest one to the sun. And it's, 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 I don't think you can see it with the naked eye, it's, it's pretty faint, but it's uh, pretty close to the sun. But there's some comets that, uh, you know, we might see them once and never see them again because it might take another 30,000 years for it to come around. So, for example, um, in the 1990s, there were two major comets uh, that I got to see and everybody got to see in the 1990s. And um, I can't remember their names. Hayakutaki might have been one of them, but uh, remember the first one, one night, it was like a February night, something like that, it was very cold out, the skies were very clear, and I went out to a, to a park outside of town to look at this comet, and it literally was about that far in the sky. It was amazing, it was almost a religious experience. You know, so it's the head of the comet and the, the tail, and the comet is orbiting the sun, as it gets close to the sun, the ice on the comet starts to evaporate, and that creates the tail that uh, the sun is, is reflecting off of. And that's why comets have tails. And, uh, and it's just amazing, just sitting in the sky like this, this big comet. And then I saw another one about a year or two later. Um, wasn't quite as impressive, but it was still very impressive. So I got to see two comets about a year or two apart. They were it was quite amazing. Anyway, both those comets, at least one of them, uh, orbits the sun every... 30,000 years. I think that was the number they figured out. Alright, so this isn't even exaggerated. It, it, it would actually be much farther out. Um, let me see if I can draw a better picture. This comet takes so long to go around the sun. It spends most of its time, here's the sun, it spends most of its time way the heck out here. Way past Pluto in, in, I think it's called the Oort Cloud. It's way out there. And there's a lot of Apparently we think there's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of ice balls and minor tiny planets and things like that and some comets hanging around the Oort cloud, Oort cloud. Occasionally they <laughs> eventually come in and orbit the sun and um, their orbit is elliptical but very eccentric, very stretched out. So it might take, like I said, 30,000 years or so for one to, uh, to whip around the sun. And so uh, they uh, thought that was pretty neat. Okay, now, um, the other thing here, like I mentioned, as my, uh, I think it's a funny story. I don't know if you appreciate Star Trek like I do, but um, in 1969, we landed on the moon. And so for a couple years, there were uh, some moon landings. And I think there were six moon landings, Apollo missions. And uh, I was there. You know, aware of all of them. Of course, I was I was a young teenager when that started going on, and um, so here's what happened. Here's the Earth and the Moon. The moon's out here somewhere. And so when we when they went to the Moon, you know, they're orbiting the Earth, and right about here we'll say they they turn on the rocket. So when you orbit the Earth. You're going around 18,000 miles an hour. Now, to escape Earth's gravity, you have to go about 25,000 miles per hour. So, whip around the Earth, and when they're ready, they turn on the rocket engines, they speed up to around 25,000 miles per hour. Starts heading toward the Moon. And the path is, takes you close to the Moon. And then, when they get close to the Moon here, they light the engines in reverse to, to uh, slow down. The rocket so it would uh, get the right speed to orbit the moon and then from there um, the landing module would, would separate and two guys would go down to the surface of the moon and then they eventually come back and meet up with the command module third astronaut was up there and then they would shoot back to earth okay so um, out here 
somewhere out here the Earth's gra uh, the Moon's gravity takes over. Most of the time the Earth gravity is slowing them down. But um, here's what's happening. When you break out of orbit, you're no longer traveling in ellipse. So when the astronauts were orbiting the Earth, they were orbiting in the path of an ellipse. When they kicked on the engines to get past escape velocity, over 25,000 miles an hour, they um, escaped Earth's orbit, and now they are traveling in a hyperbola. So the pathway is hyperbolic. I know I don't have a drawn line that look like a hyperbola, but, but it is. And um, so anytime you escape uh, the gravity, gravitational pull of a celestial body like that, you're traveling according to a hyperbola. Okay, well, um, my uh, very favorite moment in the old Star Treks. Now, I, I'm old enough to watch the old Star Treks when they came out in the 1960s. And a uh, great show. And uh, my, my favorite moment, there was an episode, I don't remember what it was. I'm guessing it's second season, but I'm not sure. All right, so the, uh, the, the Enterprise is orbiting a planet, and Kirk gets beamed down. Captain Kirk goes down to the planet, and he's... Uh, trying to defuse a war down here. He's playing diplomat. Of course, he's also falling in love with the girl, as he always does. And meanwhile, some phenomena hits the Enterprise and knocks its engines out. It's dead. The engines aren't working. They don't know how to start them up. And unfortunately, the orbit is decaying, so eventually it's going to enter the atmosphere, crash and burn. All right, so the whole uh, episode is about Kirk on the planet, trying to defuse a war and, and you know, have a romance with this uh, young lady, and then they're up in the Enterprise trying to figure out how to save the Enterprise. And Kirk's not too worried because he knows he's got all these smart people up there. So, um, probably in the course of a 60 minute episode, uh, Spock uh, does uh, Nobel Prize winning type physics, figures out how to restart the engine, and um, does all this pretty much in his head, and is hoping he calculated right. Anyway, so Kirk wraps up his business goes up the Enterprise, and they're within seconds of hitting the atmosphere. And, uh, and, and so and he got Scotty back there in the engine room. He's going, hey, Captain, I'll get her up to warp nine if I have to get out and push it myself. You know, you have all this uh, funny Star Trek stuff going on. And, and finally, uh, Kirk says, oh, just, just do it, you know. What do we got to lose? And so it works. Spock's calculations works. They start the engine. And here comes the punchline. Kirk... Barks in order to Sulu. Sulu, take us out of orbit. Hyperbolic path. And I just, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't understand it. But hyperbolic path, you cannot escape orbit without going in a hyperbolic path. So it was, it was a redundancy in the script, which I think is, is funny. Okay, now, I had uh, one last thing to tell you that's uh, a little more serious. So um, I'm drawing a quick blank. I'm going to erase this and uh, pause while I... Let me figure out what I was going to tell you. So, hang on. Well, I forgot what I was going to tell you, but I did think of one more thing. One more thing. Um, I asked a good friend of mine, had an astronomy degree, lifelong astronomer, but also a mathematician and a physicist. And I asked him, had there ever been any comets observed on a hyperbolic path? That means, is it possible to have a comet go around the sun that's going so fast that it's not going to be pulled into orbit around the sun. In other words, it's hyperbolic. And um, he said, no. No, I, to my knowledge, no one's ever observed one. But I think in the past year or so, I, I think I read about, there, there may have been one out there. So uh, if we do get a comet with a, on a hyperbolic path, it means it came from outside the solar system. And, uh, okay, I just thought of what I was going to tell you. This, is, this involves Einstein. It's good stuff. All right, so uh, in 1915, Einstein... Uh, writes up his, his general theory of relativity. And part of this thing is that uh, he says gravity distorts space. It bends space. It actually change the, changes the, the texture of space. And he worked out some calculations and said we should be able to observe this during a total solar eclipse. And sure enough, in 1919, there was a total solar eclipse. A British physicist, uh, astronomer, went off to wherever the total solar eclipse was, it might have been in Africa, his name was Eddington, and uh, brought all kinds of equipment, made some precise calculations. Here's what Einstein was saying. All right, so here's, here's the sun. Now, during the solar eclipse, the moon passes in front of the sun, totally blocks it out. 
And if, if Mercury is over here to the side, there's Mercury. Mercury is close to the Sun. Einstein said Mercury will not be observed into the position that the astronomers say it should be in. So the astronomers know where Mercury is going. He said it's going to be an optical illusion because the um, Sun creates a distortion of space. Now I'm kind of exaggerated this distortion. But the gravity pulls the space, um, pulls on the space, bends it such that the light traveling near the sun gets bent. So uh, do I have that backwards? I think I might have that backwards. Let me see. Because as you get close to the sun, it seemed like it would bend inward, wouldn't it? Okay. Well, anyway, I, I'm not very good at drawing this, but uh, apparently the the light travels along a hyperbola, because <laughs> gravity does affect light. Uh, which is interesting, because light has no mass, but according to Einstein's e equals mc squared, energy will affect the path of light. And uh, around a, a body like the Sun, which has an enormous gravitational pull, it will bend space, according to Einstein. So, Eddington, Eddington does experiment, does the calculations, and Mercury was just about spot on. Just about as close as you could be. There was Mercury, as predicted by Einstein, it was not in the same place the astronomers said it would be, and it was off by the amount Einstein said. Now, a, a physicist told me the other day, well, he's slightly a hair off, but it was so, it was, uh, so close, it was almost like noise in the data. So, it pretty much verified Einstein's relativity, uh, special relativity, that part where uh, gravity bends space. And uh, so, it was like a hyperbolic... Uh, space here. So I, I, I won't pretend that I understand this a great deal. I, I see it intuitively. I wouldn't know how the calculations go. And, uh, but uh, very fascinating. And what was very historic about this event was that uh, World War I ended in 1918. That was a big fight between the Germans and the British. And of course we were involved in a bunch of other countries. But um, probably the main protagonists were Germany and, and uh, England. For the duration of the war. And here it was a year later where a German physicist and an English astronomer worked together to prove great science. Only one year after the Great War. So it made uh, huge headlines. Okay, I think that's about all I can think of for uh, conic sections. I, I really like conic sections. I think they're, they're neat. And uh, the purpose was to give you some exposure to analytical geometry where we um, combine algebra and geometry t together in order to do some analysis. So, hope you enjoyed them. And uh, unless I add some more videos, this will be it for the trigonometry sequence.